problem, feedback dynamics, and the acceleration of climate change. Ready to go? Okay, we're going to change the way we look at it. Let's look at what actually makes climate change happen. And here we have, um, we're used to this, aren't we? Increased carbon dioxide concentration drives the heat engine. You know, scientists call it radiated forcing. That doesn't translate into anything that most of us understand. They know what they're talking about. I know what we're talking about, but most people don't. Radiative forcing is global heating. It's the heat engine that drives the change. The temperature is the outcome of the heat engine. It's like you have a big cauldron of water on your gas stove. You turn the gas up, that's the heat engine. The thermometer goes up slowly as a response. Right, this is the gas light. That's the, that's the thermometer. So, increased carbon dioxide drives the heat engine. So does methane concentration drive it. Other greenhouse gases drive it. There are effects from aircraft condensation to earth, the contrast of the aerosols, the particulates in the atmosphere. They affect the heat engine. So, of course, does the reflection from surfaces on the earth, particularly snow and ice, savannah, desert, the, the difference between water and trees and mountains. And then finally, the cloud effects, which are so difficult to model. Light reflects from the top surface, but clouds tend to act as, a, as an extra blanket and keep you warmer as well. So they go both ways. And it depends on the height of the clouds, whether they're ice particles or water droplets and the thickness of them and the size of them. It's an immensely complicated modeling area. The energy that comes in from the sun is the driver, and there are some, obviously that's what helps the, the heat energy. Uh, there's a small amount of energy from what we call geothermal energy at the center of the earth, which provides a little heating at the surface. But it's very small, and we can ignore it for the sake of today's work. Okay, so that's what drives climate change. Now we bring in the feedback processes. What we've done here is create a series of clusters, a series of clusters of feedback. Each cluster is driven by one particular uh, phenomenon, effect in the climate of behaviour and has its own effect on a particular field of behaviour. So, for instance, the cluster of feedback group 1 is driven by increased concentration of carbon dioxide and affects the increase in carbon dioxide. All the rest are driven by temperature. A bit like this. So there we have the cluster F1, driven by and affecting on carbon dioxide. All the rest of the feedback processes are driven by rising temperature, and then they, in turn, act on the driving processes that turn the heat up, which puts the temperature up, which in turn drives the drivers, which puts the heat up, which puts the temperature up, which drives the drivers, which puts the heat up, which puts the temperature up, and we have a global feedback process. What they do? Now we could look at some of those in detail, and back behind this presentation is a three-day seminar, so I'm going to be a little bit briefer than that this morning. But we could quite briefly look, for instance, at the methane cycle. And here we have methane that emerges from human activity, from plants and animals, bacteria, and methane released from store. That summed up gives the methane emissions increases methane concentration in the atmosphere. In the atmosphere, methane slowly breaks down into carbon dioxide and water vapour. Carbon dioxide adds to the CO2 stock, but the methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas and puts the heat engine up and puts the temperature up. Now there's a feedback cluster in the methane cycle which operates like this. It's driven by temperature, and the warmer the temperature gets, the greater bacterial activity and the increased methane production. This we already see. More methane production, more global heating, temperature goes up, bacteria love it even more, more methane production. You've got the idea. That's what feedbacks are all about. The next one, tundra permafrost, those great areas of the icy waste with fossil ice left over from the last ice age, deep underground, and the surfaces 
which just thaw a little bit in the summer and freeze again in the winter. Today, they are thawing deeper and deeper and deeper. We have an area about the size of France and Germany combined in Siberia now engaged in quite rapid thawing. And in that permafrost are trapped deposits of methane and deposits of the biological material which the bacteria then get out and we get release of methane. More methane goes out, more heating, temperature goes up, more thawing, more methane, and so forth. And then the really big one, there is about three times the amount of hydrocarbon energy stored in methane clathrates, as they call them, the frozen lattices of methane stored in the shallow seas at appropriate temperature and pressure conditions. Three times as much hydrocarbon energy in that methane store as in the total store of coal, oil and gas combined. That's a lot, a lot of energy. As the seas start to warm with global warming, that methane can start to release. Oh, it's not going to happen for decades. You don't have to worry about it. Well, actually, NASA reported in a confidential email to me in February 2007 that the first methane clathrate release had been detected off San Diego in October of the previous year. But please don't pass this on because the Bush administration might not be too pleased. Last December, and in the, uh, and in the months that have followed since, we know that the NASA satellite monitoring has shown plumes of methane coming up from the shallow seas of the north of Siberia as the clathrates in that continental shelf begin to move decades ahead. Hmm. We have already activated the methane bomb, as they call it, but it's a slow burn. The oceans warm very slowly and mix down to the, to the, to the seabed and then the methane comes up, and then the temperature slowly responds to that. So it's a slow but inexorable cascade feedback process. Gives you some idea, I'm not going to go through all the details of all the ones there, uh, but it gives you some idea of the feedbacks and the mechanisms behind them. Oh, by the way, heating is applied to the whole Earth system, and it's vast. I mean, it takes time to bring a cauldron of water to the boil, doesn't it? You turn the heat up full, and the temperature goes very slowly up. Little bubbles form on the bottom screen. Now, the inertia of the world is vast, and the heat engine has to do this. So here we go. Heating from all sources drives the energy that slowly puts the temperature up. It has to heat ocean, it has to heat the land mass, it heats ice before it starts to melt, it heats the atmosphere. Melting of ice takes a lot of energy before the temperature changes at all. It's a phase change from solid to liquid. Oh, and evaporation of water, increased water vapour in the atmosphere, is also a phase change that takes a lot of energy. So the heat goes through those processes before it starts to make a difference to the temperature. And if we look at changes in temperature and base our strategic policies on observed effects of temperature rise, we have missed the point on global heating. What matters is what's happening to the heat engine and strategic policies geared to observation of current effects are strategically disastrous in engaging with the system's behaviour. Oh, and by the way, just to complete the picture, there's another feedback cluster hiding here. The hotter it gets, the less inert the system is, and the faster it gets hotter. That one's only been in the uh, understanding of our science domain for the last few months. 